Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over a synopsis with Ian Land. Today we're going to talk about designing chips for space. Ian, what's different about designing chips for outer space versus terrestrial? It's not as different today as it was even 10 years ago. Because now we are starting to see a lot of chips designed for automotive using safety critical. We do still have aerospace applications. Again, those are safety critical. And then things like um, if you're riding in a train, you certainly want to have those to be safety critical. So all of the microelectronics that work for safety critical applications and maybe even security can also be leveraged a little bit more for space applications now in, as we work forward. You know, in the past, when we thought about a lot of those chips that were in outer space, a lot of those were, were worried about single event upsets, some sort of alpha particle or gamma particle hits the chip and does something, flips a bit or, or destroys some part of it. Is that still what's happening here? Is it getting much more difficult to prevent that now that we're moving into angstrom era chips and also 3D type of applications where you now have density that's much higher than what it was in the past? That's, it's an astute question and absolutely. There's really three key areas that, that we concern ourselves when it comes to microelectronic designs for space. Uh, one is the actual temperature, you know, the cooling, the limited cooling capability in space. Because if you think about it, you're in a satellite, the only way to get heat out of that satellite is to radiate it out into space. So that's one thing we concern ourselves with rather dramatically. Number two is these broad temperature swings. So for example, say I'm a satellite again going around the Earth, the sun is on one side. On the hot side, it gets very hot. On the other side of the earth, it gets very cold. Your chips have to be able to handle both of those sides of the earth, or maybe it's on the moon, same thing. And then thirdly is what we've been talking about, which is the radiation. And there's two things we worry about when it comes to radiation impingement or, or exposure. And that's one, total dose, which often people refer to it as TID. And the other one is single event effects. And there's actually about 10 different single event effects. We'll talk about a few but we'll also talk about the mechanisms for what happens with these. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Ian, what are we looking at here? Okay, what you're looking at is a traditional picture of a semiconductor gate. And, and you know, if you go back in time, this is what they look like. If you go today, this is what they look like. The difference is they're a lot smaller today. And so if we look at what happens with microelectronics and radiation, this picture can help us a lot to think through it. First of all, what we're showing here is this particle strike. And when we have those kind of particle strikes, it, it really boils down to that's where single event effects matter to us. That's when things like single event upsets, single event transients, single event functional interrupts, and single event latch up are concerns. And there's more. But those are the ones that we tend to hear most often. And the one that scares me and probably should scare most people the most is single event latch up. Because latch up, if, if it's a destructive latch, it literally will ruin the device and then it can't be used again. So one of the things we try to do is, is watch for latch up. And we do that by testing, we do that by building mitigations in. We do all kinds of different ways to design a microelectronic device such that those kind of things either don't happen or if they do happen, it's not a destructive issue, and it can be reset or changed back to its original plan. Are the chips that you're designing for space, are they increasing in the same kind of density as we're seeing in terrestrial applications? Yes, they are. For example, we are working with Raytheon Corporation, and we're looking at things like Global Foundry's 22 FDX process, and we're also looking at GF12. Traditionally, where often it's things like Skywater 90, where they're very larger, older technologies. And now we're moving down, but we're still not at the, the sub three of five nanometer type levels that we'll see in very high volume commercial applications of today. You think back on some of the, the satellites that we used to know about uh, going back 30, 40 years ago. These things were massive. They had to be fired up with a giant rocket. Yeah. Do they have to be as large anymore? And if they are that large, are they completely different? Are there, is there a lot more electronics in there, sophisticated electronics than we saw in the past? So I think the answer is yes and yes, which is today, literally, um, there's a lot of talk in places like NASA about, you know, your phone that you carry is a lot of computing power. 
you could basically put that in a box and send it into space and it's in pretty good shape, except it doesn't have all the radiation management and mitigation that we think about. So, but there are small sats today that literally are the size of what I'm drawing with my hand. Very small, and there's talk of you know, nets of, of satellites up in space. Now, there's also the opposite, which is they continue to have larger satellites, but they pack lots and lots of computation in. And what's really neat about that is you can start to see literally data centers and high performance computing in space. And that's what we're going into in the future when it comes to things like uh, some of the larger companies who are out there who are building networks of satellites, whether you know, some of the new modern commercial satellite companies, and I'll avoid naming names, but there's some neat programs they're doing to really put computation in space as well as on the ground, and they can, we can also have these network of satellites that are small. And in outer space, you're always thinking fault management, right? Correct, yeah. So actually, in, in many things, we're thinking fault management, and, and that's where we really try to leverage that capability from commercial technology all the way into space technology. If we look, there's you know, space is a random effect. And so that's something that, that we concern ourselves with because, you know, you never know when one of these particles is going to hit, you know, that gate or some other gate. And so when that happens, then we are concerned. But it can be managed. Uh, automotive safety, it's a random event too. When something goes wrong in an automobile, when there's a fault that shows up, actually it could be a fault like this. It's much less frequent when it's in terrestrial applications. Um, but it could also be some other type of fault. And so they manage faults very carefully with safety. Functional safety is the term used in automotive. Security is actually a fault, but it's a targeted fault. It's someone's coming in and actually driving in and trying to create a fault that then gives them access to information they didn't expect to have or, or that they, you didn't want them to get. And then finally, there's actually systematic faults. And systematic faults are actually the faults of every design, right? Every design has, you know, nowadays, a billion of these. The likelihood of getting a billion absolutely correct with no mistakes is pretty low. There's critical tools that can help us with all of these different types of fault management. We can go into that in more detail if you'd like. One of the things a lot of designs that were in outer space used to include was a lot of redundancy, right? Because they were always worried about, okay, there's even when you have one computer, you had two backups to make sure that you had at least two of those that matched. Is that changing as you get more sophisticated with the design here? Yes and no. So one of the things that we're doing, we actually have a report out with JPL that JPL has produced um, that talks about leveraging automotive IP in space. And what's cool there is, is a lot of what we do for, for commercial, safety, automotive, industrial, et cetera, cannot be applied into space. Now, why does that matter? Well, we can take the mitigations that are used or the tools that insert those mitigations automatically and do those same kind of mitigations for space random. Remember, the random faults. We can just manage random faults for space and automotive in a similar fashion. Um, so today, double redundancy, triple redundancy. Um, you can do built-in self-tests. You can do error correction and detection. There's a lot of capabilities that are built into the tool or actually in the IP that's already being created for automotive. And now if you look at this, in the old days, we used to take, remember um, my iPhone example, it would be a, a larger you know, computational box, but we'd have three of those boxes. Nowadays, you just triplicate critical parts of your microelectronics design. And so we can, you know, the, the tools that are out there can help you with how to choose which are critical functions and where you want redundancy, where you want to do built-in self-tests, and how you want to manage those faults. So basically what you're talking about here is that the automotive and the, the design for space, those very, very specific designs are now sort of converging, right? Yes, completely agree. What's cool is, is again, if we go back to, to principles, what tools typically do today, what IP typically does, you know, we're at a very high level of abstraction automating how these gates are put down into silicon. Now, what we were not saying, you're going to take this piece of automotive uh, semiconductor chip and put it over here in a, in a space application. That can happen, but it takes some, some extra testing and some work. And most of the time, what we're talking about is 
people will use the tools and the IP that is built for automotive applications and then translate that into a space ASIC that is now, as we go down and process nodes, um, space ASICs are, are becoming more and more popular uh, because of the need for low power, because this you know, radiation resistance still matters. As we get the process node comes down, these single event effects become more and more important. Does IP come to the spectra as well? Typically, we don't think about IP in uh, space and radiation hardened type of designs. So it certainly does. Now, what, what can be done is, for example, we talked about JPL putting a report together, leveraging automotive IP into space. Okay. Part of that is because some of the automotive IP that is produced actually already has things like what would, what would work for RADHAR by design, but it's automated redundancy insertions. It could have uh, automated insertions of, of a monitor or sensors. It can have a number of tools and capabilities that typically weren't in the past seen in a microelectronics device. Now those things are, are available and they're automated to make it simpler to build a, a chip as for space. There's a bunch of other capabilities and when it comes to IP at the standard cell level. If you recall, these, all these silicon devices that are built, they're all built in this tool database, if you will. And part of that tool database is how this library of standard cells at the bottom. Well, that library ends up being the foundation of all of these type of capabilities to build that semiconductor chip. So an automated, you know, automotive, you know, the, the automotive standard cell libraries are more robust than the traditional standard cell libraries. And again, those can be leveraged into space applications very readily, actually. Now we're looking at tools that can help with that. For example, you can use TCAD, which is technology computer aided design. And TCAD can help you with device level modeling and understanding the radiation levels of the material you're working with. There's this dynamic between the material and the process. It's called DTCO. And with DTCO, it's design technology co-optimization. You've got your material on one side, your process on the other. You move from material to process, you see how it impacts it, and then you can come back. And that closed loop control is, is actually a really great way to design. And this is something that even 15 years ago, we, it really wasn't available. You know, we're getting some really neat capabilities now that, that apply to both the, the automotive world and also the space realm. So the kind of tools that people are using in other areas are now being applied into space. Does that speed up the design process and enable you to say, okay, this is more secure, this is more robust, and do it more easily? Absolutely. What we, we are not only hearing but seeing is that customers will be able to build a, a much more robust design much more quickly. For example, there's a, a the standard cell IP library in the past often would take something like 10 years to turn that into a rad hard library. There's some proposals out there today that are looking at putting that library into something more like two to three years. And if you can do that, then you can more rapidly go to the modern process technologies. Then you can use these tools to bring things about. There's a, something called DSO.ai, uh, which is a design space optimization. And that design space optimization tool, or it's part of the other tools, um, that allows someone to really go from this broad range of different design spaces and, and very manually trying to, to do seed runs you know, in a tool to an automated AI fashion that really iterates down to a much more optimized position. And you set the parameters. So the parameters can be set for automotive, they can be set for space, they can be set for HPC, it really is, is dependent on the developer and the environment it's going into. And we're seeing big swings in, in time, reducing time to develop because of tools like that. One of the things about the tools that you're talking about here is that it changes the economics for the design side too, right? Absolutely. So if we look at you know, the customers we traditionally have worked with, the, the larger semiconductor companies, they have lots of resources and they spend at present, literally you know, half a billion dollars uh, or more towards a generation and a family. System level companies, uh, your, your traditional defense suppliers, they do not have that level of spend for each generation. They, you know, they have something like one fifth of that budget. So how do they build 
modern generation semiconductors, but do it on a much tighter budget. And they can do that with these tools. For example, design space optimization, there's extensions to, to verification, there's AI leveraging for TCAD that we've talked about. So there's a number of capabilities that are, that are all there um, and, and reduce that input, which is also important because of the, the limitations of the number of engineers that we have, in, uh, especially in, in the US, for, for actually doing electrical engineering design, designs for space, designs for automotive. The demands are much higher than the supply. So how do we get to there? We can actually help them with tools, with IP, and uh, and you know, and it, it a lot of and actually services is probably the, the other one. Uh, we have a you know, if you look, if you're if you're thinking services, then then going out there are if you're low on resources, you know, a, a turnkey design can be done. Resources can be augmented with services, and then your training. Yeah, it, you know, sometimes you just need to learn, watch someone do it, and so a good services team can help with that. It's a little different when it comes to automotive versus space, though. Because if we think about space, again, there's, there's things like ITAR. If you're building devices for space in the US, you need to consider export control requirements. And then if you're thinking about defense, sometimes a design will actually be classified. If you look at what do you want to think about when you're going to a supplier and talking to them about helping you with services, uh, there's a DMEA accreditation. Uh, DMEA, it really boils down to, this is an entity within the U.S. government who helps you to design for a classified means and also build. So there's, there's designers and there's manufacturers. And ideally, if you're building for classified systems, you're going to have both of those capabilities, the design side and the manufacturing side. Ian Wayne, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome, Ed. Thank you.